What's the sadder scam here? This Brazilian girl scammed her own mom for over $100 million, while this guy flipped out and decided to rob a corner store after losing his life savings to crypto. Let's get right to it. Number five, wedding hostage. UK man Lewis Crosby had it all. He was a cornerstone member of his community and was set to marry a girl from Singapore that he had met online. So what could have gone wrong? He threw his life savings, including the money for an agreed dowry and even his rent, into a cryptocurrency scam back in November of 2021. After losing everything, Crosby snapped. About an hour after it all went down, he formulated a drastic plan. The man picked up his air pistol, every bit as illegal to use in a crime as a real pistol, and headed to his local premier shop. Crosby walked in, rocking a hood, shades, and a scarf, and proceeded to the counter. He took out the air pistol, which looked just like the real deal, and pointed it between the counter and the clear barrier directly at one of the clerks. He demanded all the money they could give him. Under normal circumstances, this story may have been a bit longer. There may have been an escape and a period as a fugitive involved. After all, a lot of retail employees, when staring down a barrel, will gladly give away their employer's money. The two on duty at Premier that day in November, however, weren't having any of it. The pair went on the offensive. Even without the knowledge that they weren't up against a real gunman, they approached and subdued Crosby. One of the terrified employees gathered their nerves and marched right up to the shooter. The dude actually grabbed the gun and got it away from Crosby. Then put him on the ground, and held him there. There were, of course, a million ways this could have gone seriously wrong. One of the workers even grabbed a sharp, broken-off broomstick just in case. The situation could have gotten very out of hand very quickly, but the shopkeeper simply kept Crosby in check until the police arrived. When the case hit Newcastle Crown Court, Judge Julie Clementson didn't believe she was looking at a career criminal. Instead, what she saw was a man who regularly made a positive impact in his community. Everybody involved in the case agreed that Crosby was a wreck. As if the emotional roller coaster of losing his life savings wasn't enough, his desperation made him think it was a good idea to commit a serious crime. To say the man was in shambles would be an understatement. The court ended up handing down a suspended two-year sentence. Essentially, Crosby was put on probation. He's been given rehabilitation and community service stipulations and can avoid jail time by following them. Obviously, if he commits a crime during this period, he'll end up serving his original sentence. His bride-to-be and her family were surprisingly forgiving. As of this writing, the wedding is still on, with no date set just yet. Given there was a dowry involved, Crosby will have to make that back and get his life on track before he can hope to open a new chapter with a partner. Number four, involuntary scamming. Kay Ferguson, a financial manager from Australia, fell victim to two scams back to back. And then she was manipulated into doing some scamming of her own. She gave out some of her own money to scammers, but she's no ordinary victim. Around $1.1 million was scammed from her employer, Moala Water Ski Club. It's one of the sad truths of the internet that older folks and those looking for love can be gullible, and she was both. After separating from her husband in 2020, Ferguson began using a 50 and up online dating service aptly named Singles 50s, where she ran into not one, but two troublesome men. Between the two of them, she cleaned out her personal bank accounts and stole from work no less than 27 times between December of 2020 and January of 2021. It all started when Ferguson met an unidentified man on the service who decided she was ripe for blackmail. He hit her with one of the oldest tricks in the book. He used her own lust against her. After convincing her to send him explicit images, he demanded that she pay him $130,000 to avoid those images making their way to her children. You would think she'd cut her losses at that point and hop off the dating service, or at least wisen up. But you'd be wrong. A second man, using the false name William David Rodovan, was next in line. He ran a scam on Ferguson that was a bit more innocent, but much more effective. Claiming to be an engineer, he had her call him at work. During their chat, there was a loud noise and he suddenly hung up. The next time the pair talked, this catfish told his victim that there had been an explosion and some of his workers were dead. With his quote-unquote business in ruins, he didn't have the fun 
funds to pay out severance and other costs to the families of the deceased. This is where Ferguson comes in. After handing over about $225,000 from her own pocket, Ferguson was broke. The scammer, formerly known as Rodovan, however, wasn't done yanking on her heartstrings. He said he needed even more money, and Ferguson didn't disappoint. She used her position as financial officer to transfer money from her employer's business account to offshore accounts held by the scammer. Investigators and court officials would later prove that Ferguson dipped into the company's accounts at least 27 times. But it's highly likely she did it many more times than they can pin on her. The icing on the cake here? One of those illegitimate transfers was about $40,000, which Ferguson sent to herself to pay contractors for work on her house. In a show of instant karma, the house wound up being sold to pay back her employer. Ferguson's crime spree lasted a month or so before the water ski club's owner noticed something was amiss. He asked the police for help with finding the discrepancy in his finances. It didn't take investigators very long to figure out what was going on. Ferguson didn't do much to cover her tracks. Had they not figured it out, she likely would have continued sending money. After being caught in January and tried in March, Ferguson ultimately entered a guilty plea. Her people were reluctant to put all the details out there right away, but changed their tune when the judge threatened to reject the plea. In June of 2022, the courts decided on a three-year sentence of intensive corrections to be served in Ferguson's community. Walla Water Ski Club CEO Peter Duncan said he was disappointed about how it all went down, but he's not mad at Ferguson. In the end, she was just another sucker. Number three, elderly twist. A scammer out of New York by the name of Stephen Pagertanis caught a harsh 15-year sentence for his crimes, but that's actually less than the length of time he ran his grand scam. Formerly a financial advisor, Pagertanis used his knowledge and position to steal some $9 million from elderly investors over the course of 18 years. He ran the grift from 2000 to 2018 and mostly targeted the elderly, a detail that the courts dug into in his sentencing. Pagertanis was most recently recently working with Lombard Securities Incorporated, a network of independent stockbrokers with its HQ in Maryland. His relationship was more affiliate than employee, allowing him flexibility with little oversight. Naturally, his license to be a financial advisor and stockbroker was revoked when the case broke and he confessed. The scam was a simple Ponzi scheme on the surface, but Pegartanis was more qualified than anybody to run it. Already a legitimate and well-versed investment broker, he had no problem luring victims in, falsifying documents, and balancing out payouts with his take from the top. He was able to run the scam completely on his own for a staggering 18 years only because of this knowledge and skill set. The cycle would begin with an unsuspecting victim offered an investment opportunity. Pagertanis would promise investors that their principal was safe, a bold move in any investment vehicle that should have raised a red flag. Those that didn't see through the ruse were promised a fixed return, usually between 4 and 8% per year. That ROI doesn't sound like much, but it's a substantial buffer to savings and a higher rate than many legitimate investments. Once the investors were on board, they would wire money directly to an entity that was secretly controlled by Pagertanis. He would pass that money through a number of external accounts and entities to launder it. Once the money was sufficiently hard to trace, Pagertanis would send some off the top to his own account. He would also render promise payouts to investors who had been on board longer. Along the way, he would falsify documents, account statements, and other paperwork showing ownership, interest in investments, and other pertinent info. The victims of his scam were spread across the nation. Of some 13 million dollars invested, clients lost around nine million dollars in all. Janice Guqua from Florida reportedly lost two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Hope Dragone from Tiny Pachogue couldn't attend the hearing due to health issues stemming from the sheer stress of the financial losses she suffered. Instead, her children, Nicole Gensel and Ron Holson attended. Two more victims lost $3 million and $2.5 million. This case takes an interesting turn at the court phase. While most scammers would simply face criminal charges from the feds, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission filed a civil suit. He's essentially been barred from having anything to do with the investment world. A judgment was also passed down that ordered him to pay over $6 million to his victims. Even with the $5 million he paid back into the scam over the time he ran it, this would still leave victims short by about 2 to $3 million. Stephen Pagertanis was 59 when he was caught, which means he started the scam at age 41. Unless time gets cut off, he's going to be getting out of prison when he's 74. He was handed a 15-year sentence along with three years of supervised release afterwards. Number two, senior targeting. 
Christopher Dougherty, an investment planner out of San Diego, pulled off a $6 million Ponzi scheme. The man targeted the most vulnerable in society, being affluent, elderly, folk. Like most Ponzi schemes, this one fell apart when the money ran out at the top, meaning the scammer was unable to continue paying new investors. The way it all unraveled, though, wasn't like most Ponzi schemes. Where your average scammer may try to just disappear when it all comes crashing down, this guy filed for bankruptcy. He racked up debt through illegal actions, then tried to go through official courts to have it dispelled. Dougherty filed for bankruptcy in 2018 and got busted in 2019. Had he not made that filing, he may have been able to get more suckers on board and continue the scam. This wasn't even his first run-in with the law. He got caught stealing from a youth baseball league back in 2011, making this second offense that much worse. Dougherty's laser focus on rich elderly folk was a sticking point for the scam. This particular type of sucker, usually very gullible and with lots of savings at their command, reportedly made made up a bit more than half of his victims. He would mainly target those looking to grow and diversify their retirement savings to live their twilight years a bit better or leave a nest egg for future generations. The scam at its surface is pretty simple. For most victims, Dougherty started them off with safe, traditional investments. This would be a decent way to run a Ponzi scheme if you decided to do one, but he wanted more. He came up with bold and unconventional investment vehicles to grab more victims' attention. Naturally, they were all fake. Most of his investments outside of the traditional realm centered around businesses that he purported to own or farmland that he supposedly owned and would eventually be pulling a profit from. In some of these cases, he scammed more than just the investors. One couple living on a farm he may or may not have owned had their power cut at one point because they thought that Dougherty would be footing the bill. Sharon and David Vega were two of Dougherty's most prominent victims and were instrumental in bringing the whole thing down. The business relationship started some 17 years ago and they didn't suspect a thing until the payout started dried up. Interestingly, the scamming for these two didn't start until a few years ago, which means Dougherty didn't try to scam two of his most prominent customers until he was already seeing some measure of success. When Dougherty did begin defrauding two of his most prominent customers, it started innocent enough. He instructed them to take some money out of one investment vehicle that they had together and put it somewhere else. Specifically, he wanted them to put something into private placement for some unnamed farm subsidy accounts. They did what he asked to the two of about $30,000. Before too long, checks to the Vegas began bouncing. David always seemed to have an excuse at the ready, but Sharon and David were having none of it. They eventually went to the authorities and the media, kicking off the investigation that would ultimately spell an end to Dougherty's big scam. The investigation even uncovered other victims, at least two of whom were knocked financially flat by the scam. Jerry and Diane, who declined to use their last names in the reports, were left relying on their children to survive. Dougherty's scam put him high on the hog for many years. Before it all came tumbling down, he was using the ill-gotten gains for home renovation, travel, and college tuition, among other expenses. The fake investments he offered to in clients were all eventually found to be just that, fake. In July of 2020, the story finally met its conclusion. Filing for bankruptcy in 2018 and catching charges in 2019, Dougherty pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 12 years in prison. All told, his victims only got back about $3 million of the over $10 million that he took, leaving them collectively $7 million down. Number 1. Mom Scam Brazilian Sabine Cole Bogici was arrested for scamming her own mother out of somewhere around 724 million real, the equivalent of just over 142 million dollars. She ran the scam for two years and managed to get money, valuable paintings, and other goods out of the deal. Sabine didn't act alone. Diana Rosa, Aparecida, Stanesco Vulatek, and Slavko Vulatek, along with four other unnamed parties, were also brought in as part of the scam, according to official records. Together, they started out by simply tricking Sabine's 82-year-old mom, Genevieve Bogici, into handing over valuables. Before too long, though, things started to escalate. They continued pressuring the woman to wring more money and valuables from her. Eventually, the operation took a sinister turn before she finally had enough and went to the cops. Genevieve endured being physically threatened, intimidated, and even isolated by her own daughter. The scam began when Sabine set her sights on Tisilla do Amaral's celebrated painting, Sol Poente. Genevieve's late husband, Jean Bogici, was an art collector and left her a great deal of valuable art when he passed away. Sol Poente and two other pieces by the same artist fell into 
the hands of Sabine and her associates worth around 700 million real together. Sol Puente, in particular, had even had a stint in the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Tarsila do Amaral is thought of by some as the mother of Brazilian modern art, having produced seven widely hailed works of art around the 1920s. Three of these, all originals, were scooped up by Jean Bagici and later taken by Sabine and her crew. The other two paintings were Osono and Pont Neuf, and the three together formed the bulk of the gain from the scam. Sabine wouldn't have been able to pull this off on her own. The first step in the scam was to bring associates on board who would fill key roles in throwing Genevieve off guard. Chief among these were psychics. The first so-called psychic to approach Genevieve did so out of the blue and rocked her world with the grim premonition that her daughter would soon die. Sabine kept feeding this psychic and others personal information that was used to scare and coerce Genevieve. As the scam progressed, the psychics not only took fees from Genevieve, they convinced her to part with valuables. The first thing on the list was Sol Poyente. The team worked on the beleaguered mum to make make her believe that the painting was cursed and tied to her daughter's upcoming demise. Under the guise of praying for and purifying the objects, the psychics convinced Genevieve to let them haul the paintings away. Amaral wasn't the only indirect victim here. Influential artwork from a number of Brazilian masters was also involved in the heist. The works of Rubens Gertzman, Cicero Diaz, and Alberto Guignard were stolen among many others. All told, at least 16 paintings went missing. Authorities wasted no time once they were brought into the picture. Investigation proceedings, including tracking the paintings, began immediately. In August, of 2022, police began executing warrants, making arrests. Along with Sabine herself, authorities have nabbed four other suspects as of this writing. As for recovering the paintings, many were found in the homes of suspects during raids. Others have made their way to brokers and galleries. Of the 16 confirmed missing, 11 are officially back in the hands of their rightful owner. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section what you would pick. Be 25 with zero net worth knowing what you know today, or would you rather be 65 with $30 million net worth?